Small scale manufacturing and Main Street, these are secret sauces that work together and we're gonna talk about those. But I also wanna make sure we talk today about how we're saving small businesses in this time of COVID. It's a great pause in our economy that's going to last a long time. In fact, we don't know how long it's going to last. So this is an important time for us to figure out how to save our small businesses and then help them thrive after this. First of all, I wanna welcome you all here. As I said before, this is a webinar uh, hosted by the Connecticut Main Street Center in partnership with the other Connecticut organizations. And I appreciate their work together with me to, to create this event uh, and promote it. Usually what I'd spend a lot of time talking about with you is about how different each of our storefronts on Main Street can really look and what that means about the places that we have on our Main Streets and the kinds of businesses we have there and really what it tells us about the place. Is it struggling or is it thriving? And what does that mean about the place? But in reality, we're, we're in a very tough place to start. And the truth is that we were in a tough place to start even before this pandemic. The reality of today is that most small businesses are closed. This is true across the country at this point. Our joblessness in March may be 15 to 20% of the whole country on average. And in some states, that's already near 50% of all employable individuals. The additional challenge is that before COVID hit us, we were already struggling as a nation. It wasn't apparent in every county or in every major city, but it's true across the country. We had declining populations of working age adults in nearly all of our counties. We have the high income inequality in America since we started tracking it, and that was before this pandemic. And we already had the impact of vacant buildings on a block and its reduction in nearby property value and the lasting impact of, of COVID and the closing of small businesses and vacancies that are gonna come out of this is completely unknown at this point. The truth is we need a different model. Um, and, and Main Street is really at the center of that and our local small businesses will need to be at the center of that to build a strong and inclusive Main Street and local economy and get our communities back after this crisis. We need to figure out how to survive and then thrive as individuals, but also in relation to our small businesses in our communities. I want to tell you a little bit about myself for those of you who haven't met me before. Um, as I said, my name is Ilana Pruce. I'm the founder and CEO of Recast City. I come from a long line of uh, makers uh, and connectors. So my mother, you can see the picture on the left is a dress that my mother made for a semi-formal I went to in high school. Um, and on the right, many, many years later is my opportunity when I got to give a TEDx presentation about the economic power of great places. My background is in city planning, but I've always been somebody who loves to make stuff. Um, these are the amazing teenagers in my house who are figuring out both how to survive and thrive during this time, maybe more su survive at the moment. Um, but we always focused on the things that we can create from cooking um, to building things. And that's the focus of the work that I do in Recast City when we're in, regular times, and I don't even know what to call regular times anymore. Um, in Recast City, I work with local governments, with property owners and real estate developers to bring small scale manufacturing businesses into our projects, into our economic development strategies, into our real estate projects, and really figure out how they fit in as this thriving part of what we're doing. It will be essential to go back to that because they, these businesses right now have pivoted and are creating tons of emergency gear for our hospital workers on the front line and we need to support them coming out of this. But right now, we need to do a lot more. And this is in general where I would sit down and we talk about how we engage directly with our small scale manufacturing business owners. But in truth, we can't sit down directly with our small business owners. We need to sit down with them over the phone. And so how are we gonna help them? So I'm gonna talk through five major chunks today. First, I'm gonna talk through the survive and thrive framework. Um, then we're gonna talk about why we need to ditch the default model, um, the ways we can provide small business relief now, uh, how to invest in a better way, and really action we can take now to start making a difference. So first, the survive and thrive framework. This isn't a framework I developed. Um, I begged, borrowed, and stole it from lots of other sources, but it makes a lot of sense to me. 
First, we're all focusing on containment, right? We need to stay at home across the country. We need people to keep physical distance from each other to be able to contain the virus. Second, we need to provide relief, and that's to individuals and to small businesses. So the, the three different bills that have come out of the federal government in terms of unemployment insurance, tax changes, um, these new federal funding programs that I will talk about in relation to small businesses, um, but also our state and local loan and grant programs and all of the other ways that we can provide relief to small businesses need to be on the table right now. We need to get super creative very fast to make sure that our small businesses and our small business owners can survive this. And then we're going to need to rebuild. We don't know when this is going to start. Some businesses might be able to start doing it immediately through pivots, um, but this is going to be a long-term effort. We know in any crisis, the rebuilding effort, in fact, takes many years, and this is going to be nationwide this time. This is an opportunity for us to ditch the old models that we've been using, honestly hanging on to from 40, 50 years ago, um, and building a more inclusive and resilient economy. And we're going to talk about that too. But even before this crisis, most of our communities have been stuck in a default model in terms of economic development, and we need to ditch that default model. There are three major parts of that model, um, and I'm going to talk through them uh, right now. So the problem with the default model is it sort of assumed that everybody's economic development needs were the same um, and that we all wanted and aspired to the same thing. And I have to tell you from over the 25 years I've worked with communities off over the country, every community has its own personality, its own pride, and needs to be able to build its economy in a way that is true to itself and that identity. The problem, one of the problems is, is that we're building our, our economy through a model left over from the 80s. Now, I will tell you, I've loved, uh, I used to love the hair bands just like anybody else, but we don't need our economic development model to be stuck in that era. Um, we have spent a lot of time in a lot of communities just recruiting for big businesses to come to areas um, and, and putting a lot of money behind that. We've done a, spent a lot of money on recruitment instead of investing in our small businesses within our community. And we've done a lot to provide incentives for high income jobs only instead of helping our small businesses figure out how to have more sources of revenue, be more resilient, and be more prepared for changes in the economy. We also have left a lot of people and places behind. And this is really something that's incredibly apparent right now. Right, we have places that have never recovered from recessions of the past, from changes in the, in the economy in the past. Um, we have investments that really are focusing on the top three or four cities. Um, the vast majority of it in technology is still going to Silicon Valley, even though the technology ideas are across the country. Um, and we have some programs that have been created like Opportunity Zones that could be a great way to invest in our communities and invest in small businesses, but in reality have really just been going to very big shovel-ready projects in big cities anyway. And also, we have this major racial wealth gap um, that is across our country that is so apparent in, in stark contrast to today. Um, where different households are earning different incomes now. And it's not just about historic injustices, it's the opportunities that different people have today. And lastly, we have this um, crazy thing that uh, people created one suburban real estate model and now one mixed use real estate model. And we seem to be building the same thing everywhere. And I spent years and years advocating for mixed use and, and uh, development that really brings people together. But when we build places that all look the same, we, they're not going to retain their value over time. Um, we have a lot of places where it's the same coffee shop or juice bar and CrossFit. They're all closed right now, but there's nothing about those that really lends itself for us to understand that we're in a special place. And historically, we did spread retail like really expensive peanut butter. It is all over the place in malls, um, in mixed use that we built and not really in a strategic way in most places to think about where do people gather, where are our prime locations, how do we create a di dynamic flow of people in different ways that's not just about retail. And lastly, we've always had this challenge. We have approval processes that are really unpredictable in a lot of our communities. We need community engagement and we need community review, but we need to create more predictable processes so that our approval processes 
have a shorter time period and, and less money needing so that our costs of, of construction can go down also. On top of this, we have what's going on today with our crisis, right? And we have this context of what's been going on in our local economies for a long time. And then we have the crisis of nearly every small business being closed. And we need to provide small business relief right now. And I'm gonna go through a few of the existing programs that have come up just in the last week. And then we'll talk a little bit more, more about what is possible. So there's three key pieces that I think we have to keep in mind before we look at the specific programs that are out there. We need to strengthen social connections between our business owners and between our local government and service providers and the business owners. We know from research from other disasters, including Katrina, that the small business owners that have strong social connections are more likely to survive and then be able to rebuild than the ones that don't have the strong social connections. So we need to spend time right now finding those business owners and building the social connections so that they can survive and thrive. Second, we need to help more small businesses find new sources of revenue. What kind of pivots can they do? What kind of online sales can they do? Is there anything that they know how to do that is in demand right now that might not be part of their usual form of business? And how do we help them work together to find new partnerships and create those, those revenue sources. And third, we have to provide relief that reaches all populations. It's very clear from the programs that are coming out and the conversations that I'm having with small business owners that I know that the programs that are out there now are only going to meet the needs of a subset of businesses. Our micro businesses are unlikely to access it um, and there's a lot of need that's out there that we have to address. So, First, I wanna talk about some of the existing programs that are out there. You might've seen a lot of material come out in the last week about this. this. These two programs were only passed last Friday. So this is moving fast and furious. Um, and one of these programs is in fact only gonna go live tomorrow from what I hear. So the acronyms, I'm gonna talk about acronyms and then the programs themselves. EIDL is the Emergency Injury Disaster Loan Program. And PPP is the Paycheck Protection Program. And I wanna note as we go into it, these are only one part of the relief that we need. So the Emergency Injury Disaster Loan Program is an existing loan program from the Small Business Administration that has been adapted to the needs of today. Um, it's and it's expanded in terms of who can apply. Uh, small businesses under 500 employees, nonprofits, people who are self-employed and sole proprietors are all allowed to apply to this program right now. It's a loan program. So it has up to 30 years in terms of the term. It has reasonable low rates, um, but it can, and it can be used for um, the, the, all of the needs of, of the businesses right now. And I think it is that somebody just noted that they think it's the economic injury, and I think you're right, so I will fix this. Um, applicants can receive, and this is a change to the program, a $10,000 grant as soon as they apply for the program within three days of application. Um, this uh, grant can be received even if the applicant does not receive the loan in the end. Um, so it's a, a really strong opportunity for folks to get a, a quick influx of funding to continue their work and cover some of their costs. People can apply for the EIDL um, and also apply for the other federal program, PPP, but the funds must be used for different purposes. So they can cover different months of salaries or that one can cover debt and uh, uh, the rent uh, versus salaries, um, but they have to be used for different purposes. This program is live. It's, you apply directly to the Small Business Administration on their website. The second major federal program that's been launched is the Paycheck Protection Program. And this is similar. You can be a small business, up to 500 employees, nonprofit, self-employed, and sole proprietor. This program specifically is to color, cover the cost of salary and benefits for up to two and a half months. So the idea behind this is that the programming wants small businesses to either retain or rehire employees as compared to before the crisis. And if you can show that eight, weeks later you still have or you rehired those employees the program funding will be forgiven and if you hire half your 50 percent of your people back it will be half forgiven you get the sense of it 
Um, but at its base, even if it's not forgiven, um, it's a very low rate loan. It's a 0.5% loan with a, a term of two years. And it can cover uh, salaries, benefits, uh, taxes for the employees, and the funding can be used for rent and utilities, but at least 75% of the funding must go for salaries. Guidance should be coming out today in, to provide more detail about this. There is uh, an example application already on SBA's website. All of the requests for PPP funding are going to go through the SBA lenders. So that's the local bankers that do SBA loans. So reach out to your local bankers if you're interested in this, uh, if you would like more information about uh, how to apply for this. So then the question is, how do we support businesses that are not being served by these programs? There are tons of small businesses that don't want more debt and um, aren't going to be able to rehire their employees within the next two months because we don't have any predictability in, in what is going to be open and when. And so they're not gonna be able to uh, receive these programs. What else do we need to do to rebuild and prepare and be able to survive and be able to rebuild for a more inclusive economy? The answer really is we need to invest in a better way. And this, honestly, we needed to do before all of this crisis, but it's even more clear today. We know that place is key to economic strength. The places, the communities that have been investing in their main streets and their downtowns, they, are, they have been thriving. They have been um, bringing people together. And so we know that investing in place is still key to economic strength and will be again. We know that having something unique about the community is in fact key to economic longevity. And we were talking about this uh, in relation to the real estate, places that prize their unique architecture, their unique small businesses, their unique natural environment, you can't find it anywhere else. And so people gravitate towards that within the community, they're proud of that within the community, um, but it also draws people from the region and potentially nationally to see what is unique about that place. And then, as I mentioned before, the social connections are essential. They've been essential all along, and we need to really build up those strong social connections for our business owners to make sure that they can pivot together now and rebuild together in the future. And obviously, main streets and small-scale manufacturers are essential to this. What I would like to do right now is just talk a little bit about how do we do this with intention and purpose, Right, we need to invest in the people who live there. These are your residents, these are your people. This is not about recruitment. This is about how do we help the people who live there now. It is about investing in the place with those people and creating the new structure to support and scale and invest in this. And the truth is we do need to think long-term, but we need to act now. And, and that's part of what I wanna talk about. Very briefly, the small scale manufacturers, since I have your attention anyway, I, I wanna give you, a, just for those of you who aren't familiar with, with this topic, a really quick uh, summary of what's out there. These, these are hidden gems in our community. Um, our small scale manufacturers give us a reason to gather in our community because people are really proud of seeing products in their community. And I'm gonna guess after this, all of our producers who have pivoted to help save our hospital Frontline workers are gonna be the heroes alongside them. But it also creates an opportunity to, to build a more inclusive business community. It doesn't matter what your background is, where you come from, your education level. You, as long as you know how to make a thing, you can create a small product business. Um, these businesses also help us fill storefronts. There's, they can sell online and also sell on a storefront. Um, they can create their product in their retail space as long as uh, zoning allows it, and that's pretty easy for us to fix. Um, and then and you can have this dynamic business where it has multiple sources of revenue out of the storefront, out of the retail that they're selling online, and potentially wholesale as well during regular times. Some of these businesses have been able to move their products to production at home so that they can continue their businesses during this time. These businesses, as they fill our storefronts, also increase property values because they bring energy to the storefronts and that's pretty essential along the way. And they attract more business owners. We, um, we know that business owners talk to each other. So when we treat our small business owners well, uh, word gets out very quickly. And obviously all of these pieces are part of a thriving main street. Who are they really briefly? Um, these businesses are artisans, are maker businesses, um, you can 
you pick a name and stick with it, um, small scale, uh, artisan is generally going to be a one to four person business, mostly using hand tools um, and in a small production space. This is Katie Stack. Her business is Stitch and Rivet. Um, she's grown from one to four employees to create um, handbags and leather goods. We also have businesses that are prototyping hardware um, or doing small batch production, drones, technology, um, and uh, other kinds of consumer products. And then businesses that scale. So this is, we know that breweries and distilleries are, are obviously popping up all over the country. Our distilleries in many cases have pivoted and are creating hand sanitizer at this point, which is pretty amazing. Um, but these places have and will in the future, again, be places that people gather. Um, we know that people are looking for, for and will again, will look for places to gather. And this is an essential part of it. And then we have maker spaces. Maker spaces are um, open to the public. Um, it's a place to come learn how to use these tools and for small businesses to access tools that might be more expensive than that, what they can afford on their own. And um, these businesses are right now pivoting to create tons of products for our hospital workers, um, but are also uh, core places for workforce development, for education, um, and, and for small business growth. And then we have shared uh, production spaces, shared kitchens, shared commercial kitchens being the one that's popped up all over the country over the last five years, um, and really essential for uh, food product businesses to access commercial um, health stamped spaces and really be able to scale before they can afford to build out their own spaces. What does this mean for our local economy? So one of the projects um, that is still working hard to, to support and save their small businesses is the Loop Community Improvement District. Uh, in Columbia, Missouri. Um, they have this area that even before uh, having to close down all the local small businesses um, was pretty bare bones and needed a, a lot of, wanted, had a future wanting to create a place where families can come together. We worked with them to really define a set of outcomes of where small scale manufacturing can thrive, where families can come together, um, and a place for the community to gather. We worked with them to host a series of meetings, interviews with local small businesses, um, bringing the community together to understand what their needs were and, and what people wanted to see in this area, um, getting out to talk to product businesses and understand their needs, which is still essential even if we can't get out, um, and then really helping them understand how to access these hidden and diverse local businesses to be a part of the growth. Obviously, Carrie has to pause that growth side, um, but because of the network she had built before with us, she really has a clear way of reaching out to people and and uh, engaging them through this process uh, as places are trying to survive and then thrive. And they will have a commercial shared kitchen on their corridor uh, once we all come back out of this crisis. Now I wanna pause for a second and really acknowledge something that I think we're not talking about enough on all of these conversations that I've been part of. I hear from local economic development staff and local Main Street staff and business improvement district staff all of these things, people were exhausted, were overwhelmed, were understaffed, we're not getting support that we need. There's so much need from small businesses that we, we don't even know what to do. We were struggling before and this is just tipping us over. And I wanna be clear that I hear you, that there is way too much to do and it's really, really hard. And what I'm talking about is not about doing more, it's about really being strategic about how to go forward because we know that we need to help in a different way. We know we need to help our main streets and our small businesses survive and then thrive. That means us as individuals, you as individuals, um, but then also our small business owners uh, and their employees and figuring out the right path forward and the different ways that we can support them. The reality is we need to take action. We need to take action to save our small businesses, um, but, but I propose that there's a different way we go forward. First, I think we need to find the small businesses not stepping forward. There are a lot of small businesses that are going to be at the front of the line for EIDL and for PPP. And then there's going to be a vast majority of them is my bet that do not come forward because those aren't the right programs for them. We need to go out and find them. We need to make sure we um, go out and find ones that rep represent the demographic diversity of our community um, and really make sure that we're being inclusive in, in identifying the business owners and the businesses in need. Second, we need to find out what they need. 
we're all of our governments very rightly are throwing loans and grants in front of people. We've set up nationally a new unemployment uh, insurance program so that more people, including contractors uh, and people who are self-employed can access unemployment now with additional funding. Those are important steps, but we need to reach out to our small business owners to understand what they need so that we can figure out what are those gaps in the assistance? What are they accessing? What are they not accessing? Um, what are they trying to figure out how to do? And really having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Third, we need to fill the gap in a new assistance with local initiatives. Most communities are going to be getting community development block grants soon, um, if not already. Um, these funds have tons of flexibility. There's a bunch of funding going to state governments to create programs that could also newly support um, businesses in other ways. We need to understand what those barriers are, what are the gaps that those small businesses are facing across the diversity of our business owners, and then we need to create initiatives to fill those gaps. This is, might be uh, adapting existing programs that we have so we can deploy these programs quickly. Um, it might be creating new ones, but also streamlining the way that we can provide support because we understand more specifically the challenges that these businesses are facing. And then fourth, we need to build a brand new six month strategy. Any economic development strategy at the local level, any uh, big long-term plan we have may or may not be accurate in the future, but we know that for the next six months, at least things are going to be very, very different. And this means offering assistance in multiple languages. This means creating new connect, working with new connectors of all different kinds to get information out. Um, this means providing grants that are focused on business owners that are often not at the front of our line for different support programs, business owners of color, women, immigrants, um, and figure out not only how to reach the populations, but figure out what they need. And that's just, a, that, that six month strategy uh, needs to be built on the capacity within the community, right? Not if we wave the magic wand and add 100 people to help, but based on the capacity within that community and the support that it can get from uh, all of the programs and funding that are coming through. If you want help with that, um, there, I'm providing information about these programs like EIDL and PPP, um, but also just trying to lead conversations on LinkedIn uh, about how we do this. So you can sign up for the Recast City newsletter, um, which I think you guys all did by signing up for this webinar. Um, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, that's where I post every great idea that I see anybody else creating in another community. I'm consuming those and trying to share the best models, not every program, but the best models I'm trying to share out on LinkedIn. Um, but you can also email me to schedule a call. Um, and I'm happy to talk about um, what you're facing, those four steps that I was just talking about, and how Recast City might be able to help. So um, schedule a call. You can email me directly or you can go to the website. Um, and there's links there to be able to just directly schedule a call with me. I wanna take the, a second and, and sort of acknowledge one last thing, and that's that um, we know that we wanna go back to the places that we love, right? We all wanna be out in these places where we can stop and see our friends and be on the street and, and be on Main Street and um, talk about um, how to bring everybody back together, and we will get there. Um, we know that this is why we do the work that we do. We know that creating the festivals and bringing our small scale manufacturers and other small business owners out together is what builds our community pride. It's what makes us know where we are and it's, it's the, the mainstay of what we all do. And that's going to be essential in the future and it's essential today to find ways to do that virtually um, and to be able to do it digitally and be find ways to come together. People are proud of the things that they make. People are proud of the small businesses that they've created in our communities. And we need to be there to support them to survive and then to thrive coming out of this crisis, right? We need our local leaders to be a part of it. We need our elected officials to lead at the local and state level. And we need to figure out in detail what those gaps are to make sure that we can really provide the support at, as in an inclusive way to make sure that all of our small businesses can survive and thrive because we know we want to make great places that people are proud to call home. It's what we always have done together um, and it's what we know we're going to be doing in the future. So we have to make sure we're still focused on these outcomes that we're trying to achieve. 
So with that, I'm going to take questions. Um, if you would like to reach out, you can reach out, I'll remind you, um, on LinkedIn, um, or you're always welcome to email me as well. I'm going to take us off of, I'm gonna take questions now. Let's go back. Um, this recording will be emailed to attendees as long as I did this correctly. Um, and um, I am going to uh, share it with everybody who registered for this event. Um, I will fix this information uh, about the name of the program, EIDL. Um, NGO. NGO means a, a non-governmental organization. It's a term just for nonprofit organizations. So nonprofit organizations can apply if there are 501c3. They can apply for both the EIDL and the PPP funding. Um, the SBA loans that I was talking about with the local lenders, um, those are for SBA 7A lenders. Um, I can share a, a post that has links to how to search for local SBA lenders if that's helpful. Um, one of the participants who's uh, been always very helpful on these details noted that I should add that if you did apply for an EIDL prior to this week, you should reapply on the SBA website um, because this is um, the one that's out this week has the $10,000 grant in it, and anybody who applied before this week, um, that wasn't in there. Um, the guidance for the Paycheck Protection Program, I just want to clarify, um, that guidance is not out yet, and we're, everyone's sort of waiting with bated breath to know exactly how, that, um, how that's going to work, um, and what the payroll requirements and what the forgiveness, all of the details in that is all going to maybe come out today, um, and maybe come out tomorrow, but it's going to be important to have information about your payroll from last year um, and from the start of this year. So you can start getting your information together. One of the questions that came through, let me stop sharing. One of the questions that came through is, um, can I talk about ways to find existing micro and small businesses and small scale manufacturers? Great question. Um, I have a whole blog post on that, and I'm happy to talk through that a little bit here uh, and share that resource as well afterwards. Um, one of the things to look at is local festivals. So any holiday markets that are hosted in your area where local businesses participate, um, any festivals where you have vendors, um, any of those vendor lists, uh, any farmer's market that has products also sold at it in general, um, all of those are micro businesses. Um, I would also recommend finding the connectors in your community, your faith leaders, your other neighborhood leaders, every, different civic organizations, cultural organizations, and actually creating a, a shareable note or a form that they can send out to their members and, and ask them to ask their members and their community to, to join a list of micro and small businesses. I think one of the essential things to think about is who do those small businesses and those micro businesses already know and trust and how do you find that connector and ask them to help you find those businesses? Um, there are, if you wanna do more, ton of resources. Um, Patrick McMahon, um, who is my wonderful sponsor uh, for this event from the Connecticut Main Street Center, uh, reminded me that um, there is a lot of uh, content that, I've, that is out there on it. Um, so uh, three years ago, I created a, 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 con a report called Made in Place in partnership with Smart Growth America. Um, that publication is uh, available online. Um, all of the blog posts on Recast City also note uh, all the different ways to do this. Um, and obviously the National Main Street Center is, is a, an amazing resource on small businesses as well. Um, if you're interested in looking at how to change zoning, government is still trying to do things. So if we want to try to figure out how to include small scale manufacturing or artisan manufacturing as a permissible land use now, um, that information is in made in place. It's also on my website. You can also just email me. Um, there's tons of communities that have adopted it as an allowable land use and then just added that land use um, to a bunch of existing zones. Um, do I know of any step-by-step -step tutorials to provide business owners 
who are applying for EIDL or PPP. There are a ton of sites that are doing detailed information about it. I am not doing that because I'm, I'm helping the people helping the small businesses, um, but I will work on finding a good example of that and sharing it on LinkedIn. So please connect with me on LinkedIn um, and I will try to figure out who is the best one of the ones that I've seen from that. I'm also getting questions in under Q&A, uh, which I've now uh, found it. Um, one person noted that they're having difficulty finding guidance on the deferment of existing SBA loans. So from what I understand on that, you have to contact um, your SBA loan officer and request the deferment. It will be uh, all, potentially automatically six months, but it could be up to 12 months. But I definitely suggest um, contacting your SBA lender on that. Um, one person asks, how can you see municipalities using interns remotely over the next few months? That's a good question. I think interns can be great at data collection. So um, there is no way that nearly any community has all the information that they need about small businesses and what's going on and what was going on before. I do think this pause is an amazing opportunity, especially if you have interns, to be able to create a super robust list of the small businesses of all different size, of all different types, of all different materials um, throughout your community, really using those connectors to put out, push out that information, and then to ask for really detailed information about what people are seeing now. I probably wouldn't have interns do the phone call interviews with small business owners unless they're really experienced in that kind of facilitated conversation. Um, to be respectful of the small business owners and, and what they're trying to do. Um, but I do think the data collection could be a great opportunity for interns. The other one is to, like the question before, who has the best example of a tutorial about how to apply for different programs from the local community, from the state, and from the federal government? They could do that kind of research as well. Um, one person noted that they don't ever think of small scale manufacturers as being places for people to gather. Um, I totally understand that. So I think it depends on what you're thinking about in terms of small scale manufacturing. I, when I talk about small scale manufacturing, I'm talking about businesses that are generally one to 50 people. So they're really micro businesses as compared to what the rest of the universe defines. And if we're talking about Main Street, it's probably 20 or fewer people and they're modern manufacturing. They're great neighbors. Um, they're quiet, they're clean, and they're interesting. You can walk by a glass storefront and see things being made. And I will tell you that as an amenity that, you, that we've never seen before, that people have their, including me, have their windows up against the glass, really trying to see how things are made in, in, in the store. So it might be more consumer facing in a storefront or on Main Street, and a couple blocks off Main Street, it might be more a supply chain focused. Um, there is still manufacturing that is noisy and dirty, and those shouldn't be on Main Street necessarily if somebody's a machinist and making a lot of noise carving out metal. But if we think even of additive manufacturing, that's a, still a very quiet and high tech process of, of pieces being made. Um, what we're seeing with a lot of the consumer uh, focused small scale manufacturers before this crisis is that they create tons of programming in their space and, and become a space for events because overall people are looking for places to gather. There's a great survey that was done years ago called Soul of the Community that showed that people stayed in small and mid-sized communities for three major reasons. It was this, an analysis they did over a bunch of years. Um, people want places to gather, right? We know people now are desperate to come together, although won't for a long time but people inherently wanted places to gather um, they, and stayed in a place because there were places to gather. They wanted to feel included. It was a place where they felt included and there was some aesthetic beauty about the buildings, the natural environment. So um, small scale manufacturers have realized, these product businesses have realized that if they give people reasons to gather, um, it increases their brand exposure, right? We think about experiential retail, um, which has been a key part of our retail environment now for a bunch of years, having reasons to gather in our small scale manufacturing businesses is part of experiential retail. So um, it becomes a, a great, a great partnership. 
One question came in says that I know that a lot of what I mentioned were steps that are needed to be taken prior to COVID-19. Um, do I think that this disruption has put an emphasis on those issues? I think that most people or most things I see being written are focused on panic, um, and focused on this emergency response to get funding out uh, loans and grants as quickly as possible, which is fine. Um, I haven't seen very much written uh, or created yet that's focusing on uh, inclusion and equity in this. Um, it's, it's being spoken of in inclusion and equity circles um, and in business circles that have been focused on how to support uh, an inclusive and diverse set of business owners but I don't see it as yet as part of the broader conversation. Um, and I think it's a really important conversation to have now um, while we're sending gobs of money out into the small business world, uh, because right now the way that money is going out, there will be even more extreme of the have and have nots coming out of this in the small business world. And so we need to very specifically understand what are the needs of people who are not applying to these programs and how do we address those needs with other funding. The federal government is going to do another um, piece of legislation for uh, helping people uh, around the economy um, because of the pandemic. Um, what else do we need from the federal government? What else do we need our states and our local governments to be doing to support these businesses that aren't going to apply for the existing programs? So I think that having this conversation about um, economic inequality, income inequality, the racial wealth gap, um, and the, the need to very purposely build a diversity of business owners as we rebuild um, to make sure that the benefits are really going to our entire population of business owners is really essential at this point. Can I identify successful, specific successful business incubator programs um, that can help other communities. So um, one of the examples in here that's asked is about makerspaces. So makerspaces can work as small business incubators, but not necessarily. Um, makerspaces are different to me than, uh, for instance, a commercial shared kitchen. Makers, makerspaces are open to the public. People can come, they can take lessons, they can be a member, they can be a hobbyist uh, in that space. They are also spaces that where, depending on how the makerspace has been created, they can do workforce development and job training. They can be a resource for entrepreneurs and people who are creating product businesses. Um, but that has to be a part of the mission of that makerspace. Um, and it's a really specific uh, set of tasks to pursue that work and a really specific set of partnerships. So OpenWorks Baltimore is an enormous makerspace that got tons of wonderful philanthropic and public support to open. Um, right now, they have completely pivoted all of their work because they're obviously close to the public and they're producing gear for hospitals uh, in the Baltimore area. They are open to the public, they have workforce training programs, and they do programming specifically for entrepreneurs um, with a really specific focus on underrepresented uh, populations in entrepreneurship. Um, to really raise that up. There are other ones that, that don't do that. That is different than a commercial shared kitchen, which is also a kind of incubator. A commercial shared kitchen is only open to businesses, right? You have to have a business to go in and create either for catering businesses or a, a food product business. Um, I focus predominantly on the food product businesses in that environment. So um, you have to have done certain certifications for handling a food to be able to even work in a commercial shared kitchen, right? So it's focused on how to support um, small scale uh, product, food product businesses. So those are, are two really different ones. Um, there's an amazing um, commercial shared kitchen up in the Boston area called Commonwealth Kitchens um, in Dorchester, Massachusetts. That's a mission driven commercial shared kitchen. Some commercial shared kitchens are for profit, some of them are nonprofit. This one in Massachusetts is a nonprofit and it's focused predominantly on immigrant women um, and helping them not only develop their business concept, but launch their businesses. And, and they've been really phenomenal as, a, 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 as an example of that. Um, and there's another one out of Los Angeles that is similarly mission driven like that, that is really a national standard, although it's not coming to my mind right now what it's called. I will say there are other ways to incubate businesses. So there's a real estate project 
a development in DC, I'm in Washington, DC, there's a, a development project in Washington, DC where the developer has, an, has a, a pedestrian corridor that more or less bisects this project to go from the, the main road to, in this case, a metro station. But it's, it's non-prime retail uh, frontage. And they negotiated with the city to commit to that area being for artisans, and they created micro retail spaces. And so the spaces are anywhere from 450 square feet to 800 square feet. So these are tiny, tiny retail spaces. And the other thing that they committed to was a below market lease rate for 30 years. Now their retail front, the prime retail frontage is still regular prime retail frontage, but this non-prime retail corridor is now filled with artisans that can do production and retail in those spaces and is honestly incubating businesses just by providing this low cost space with a long-term commitment to it. So that's another way to incubate this. I have more questions that have come in um, through the chat. Um, Uh, I do want to note that the, uh, folks did note this to everybody, but that the Connecticut Small Business Development Center is helping businesses apply for those federal programs. Um, and I would definitely reach out to local SBDCs uh, to get that kind of direct technical assistance for small business owners. Um, both SBDCs and uh, the Women Business Centers got additional funding for to provide technical assistance through this last stimulus bill. Um, and um, in Connecticut, folks can both contact the Small Business Development Centers. Um, they can contact SCORE um, and the Women's Business Development Centers for all of these different kinds of assistance. So, someone asks, to make sure I heard you correctly, when a business applies for EIDL and requests a $10,000 grant, even if the loan is subsequently not approved, the business does not have to repay the $10,000 grant. That is my understanding of it. I will beg you to please verify that information, um, but that is correct as we understand it today. Um, just to be clear, that only went live at the beginning of this week. Um, and when you go to the SBA website um, for this, the first thing it does is, is have the interaction for you about the grant, um, even before you get to the loan information, from what I understand. So. Um, that is that is up front and center in what they're doing. Um, I will honestly tell you that I also know business owners that are not applying because they don't believe it. So I don't know. I, I don't I don't know what to tell you. But based on what we know, um, that is exactly what happened. But um, as Trevor has noted, um, not everyone will uh, receive the ten thousand dollar grant. Um, but it is being given out before a full review of the loan goes through because we the SBA knows that the full loan review might take a long time much longer because of the huge number of people um, asking for this kind of assistance. Another person asked how do you deal with small businesses in violation of zoning for instance we welcome small landscapers but you can't keep your commercial kitchen equipment on your residential property um, they may not want to add their name to the list of micro businesses. Uh, because they're going to get in trouble with town. Um, that's a great question, right? I mean, we have business licensing information. We have people that haven't been um, necessarily following all of those kinds of zoning rules. I mean, there are plenty of communities that do have fees that they impose on businesses um, when they are violating these rules. Um, and unfortunately, some jurisdictions uh, are saying that if you owe even up to $100 in any kind of fees to the city, you can't apply for that city's um, emergency grant funding, which I think is a problem. Um, but um, I think it's still worth reaching out. I think people might find that in this time of crisis, um, their need for help is greater than their concern about what's going to happen in the future. Um, and I think we need to offer help um, really explicitly and offer that help through the connectors that they trust. Um, so uh, if it's a language barrier, a cultural barrier, a racial barrier, an income barrier, we have tons of those barriers in our communities. We need to, we have the responsibility to find those connectors and help and work with them to, to help make the connection to these people. 
So uh, another uh, question, this is from Patrick, it's for cash strapped municipalities, where do they find funds to provide micro grants to help assist a wider audience? Great question. Um, there is funding coming through to states uh, for communities right now. So in the last stimulus bill, there is a ton of money, I'm sure it's still not enough, but a ton of money coming through states uh, in the form of community development block grants that's going to be given out to communities. Each state is deciding how it's being given out. In a lot of cases, it looks like it might be population based um, because only the biggest few cities are getting direct allocations from the CDBG program. And this is on top of whatever the community received uh, for CDBG this past year. So I spoke to one community um, in Pennsylvania. Um, they looked like they were going to get an additional 75% of what they would usually get for a whole year. So I would look at that funding as a key resource. Um, and I would look at the state. There are all sorts of state funding sources that uh, they're creating to try to help small business right now. Any other questions coming in? I think, wait, I think there's one more under there. Um, there's a growing cottage food industry in Connecticut. How do you see this fitting into small scale manufacturing? Great question. The cottage food industry, um, just to clarify for folks, um, that means people who are making food products at home and then selling them. Um, every state has different cottage food laws, um, and I'm not specifically familiar with Connecticut's. Um, and um, the world of cottage food is, works like this, as far as I understand. You make as much as you can at home until you either run out of space or um, you run out of patience from the people in, other people in your home. And so um, food products that are made at home are absolutely part of the small scale manufacturing world to me. Those are, those are small product businesses. Um, and so that makes it even more important to create commercial shared kitchens um, in more places so that those cottage industry, cottage food industry businesses can then have the opportunity at a low cost to scale into a commercial shared kitchen. Um, and so um, starting to reach out to cottage food producers, people who might be doing it as a second or third form of income, um, it's still going to be important to, to find them, um, figure out how to help them, and then ultimately, in the future, be able to connect them with new resources like commercial shared kitchens. So that's a great question. Um, somebody reminded me that I missed a question. Um, planning and zoning. Planning and zoning land use templates to help write new regulations. So um, if people are interested in adding artisan, land, uh, artisan manufacturing as, an, as a permitted land use, um, email me. I'll figure out which blog post I put it in. Um, there's a bunch of different cities that have adopted it, and, and they really took a, a small paragraph, added it as an amendment, as a permitted land use, and then added it to different zones. So it's been pretty straightforward in a lot of different places, and um, I, can, I can put up my email address again in case you need it, um, but uh, I think you all got emails from me anyway uh, for this event, so you can just reply to any one of those and they come to me. Um, and one other note, um, one person says community development block grants in Connecticut, those funds are administered by the Department of Housing uh, and that department's priority is housing exclusively. Though a municipality can apply for funds to help businesses, it won't be approved according to my program contact at Department of Housing. This is extremely unfortunate. Now that is a huge problem. So if your um, community development block grants get um, distributed to localities with a housing requirement, there's tons of housing needs, right? We need to make sure people aren't getting kicked out of their homes for because of mortgage or rent that they can't pay. And that's a really essential basic need that we need to address. Um, but on top of that, um, there is um, this real need to figure out how to use that funding in a more flexible way right now because we need that flexibility. I don't know if that's an advocacy question that, that uh, the Connecticut Main Street Center needs to take on, um, or how to organize around that. But um, I think that there's a ton of flexibility. Um, I see that people are raising their hands. Um, I'm not using that function because it's gonna have too many different pieces. So if you have a question that you do still wanna ask in these last three minutes, um, post it to the chat um, and I will make sure to answer any remaining questions um, in a follow-up email uh, to you as well that includes the recording of this in case you wanna share it with folks. Um, the last question, Patrick gets the last question uh, as a thank you for hosting this uh, from the Connecticut Main Street Center. Are some small 
scale manufacturers sharing space, definitely. Um, so we see uh, there are places that are um, just uh, small scale manufacturers um, in different in a in a building, um, all being subdivided for small scale manufacturers, and then within those spaces, some businesses share space. Um, so I know a letterpress business sharing space with uh, a print, another kind of uh, a jewelry business. Um, they're in the same room. They sh they split their lease. Um, this really is going to be dependent on the property owner and their flexibility to be able to be willing to have multiple businesses in a space. It works really well. Um, people sometimes need some matchmaking to figure out who they can share space with, but as long as they have complementary businesses, there's a huge opportunity for that to be able to reduce the cost of space for folks. So if you have additional questions or additional comments, please reach out to me directly. Um, you have my email address, but I will repeat it here. It is I L. A N A at recast R E C A S T city C I T Y dot com. Please let me know if you have any other questions. If you want to talk about those four steps that I talked about of what we need to do today, um, I am um, gearing up Recast City to be able to provide five week quick hit assistance around those four pieces um, to, to find the small businesses, understand their needs fill the gaps and create the six month strategy. So I'm happy to help and talk about how we can work with you on that. Um, but I hope everyone uh, has a, a strong and resilient rest of your day. I hope you get outside to see some sunshine and fresh air and I hope that you all be well. Thank you for joining today, bye.